Again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have several folks from OSAC here today to facilitate this webinar. We're going to be hosting a second version of the same training next week. So if you have other colleagues at your institution or in the work that you're doing, but at other institutions, feel free to forward on the webinar information to them as well. Uh, I'm Carrie Thomas. I'm the College and Career uh, Access Specialist with it with OSAC, and I am going to be facilitating the webinar experience and keeping an eye on the chat and all those things uh, today. I'll go ahead and pass the proverbial microphone over to Kristen Vreeland. Hi, I'm Kristen Vreeland. I'm the former administrator for FAFSA Plus. I'm transitioning to a role with our scholarships team, um, so I'm excited about that. However, both uh, Michelle and Anne will be taking over the program, um, and so you're in some really good hands. I'm here just to kind of be support um, during the transition to passing on the administration of the program. Welcome to our webinar. Hi, I'm Ann Shearer, um, and I am the new state grants and one of the two new state grants administrators and I'll pass it on to Michelle. Hi guys, uh, my name is Michelle Slay and I am also one of the new state grant administrators and I'll be hosting the presentation today. I'm teaching you a little bit about FAFSA Plus. So um, we'll review today what FAFSA Plus is, um, how you can utilize it and the resource that it can provide for you. Currently, FAFSA Plus is for FAFSA applications only. Um, ORSA is not fed into the system because it only comes from the information provided through the FAFSA at this time. We um, use this information. It all comes from the graduation, the current graduating class. So your seniors is where this information is um, going to pull from. And we'll talk about how we get the information about your senior classes and um, how you then get the information about their FAFSA as we move through. We try to update this process. It's a um, twice a week starting in about mid-October through the end of the school year, um, allowing for you to see regular updates about information and um, where your students are at in completing their FAFSAs. This is to help you just kind of know how to guide your students, um, data management, making sure that you can help a student transition if they're stuck in a verification um, situation with their institution. You'll have some cues to help you know how to help your student navigating um, the getting started process with their um, college or university. And we'll go through all that as we move through. The how do I apply? I know two have recently applied um, with Allison and uh, Jennifer for the others. Um, if you have not applied, uh, these are the steps on, on how to do so. So it is a non-competitive application. You would just go to our OregonStudentAid.gov website to request access. Um, the application is going to provide some details needed to set up your account. Um, the type of individuals that can have an account are essentially anyone that is connected to an educational or a community-based organization that is assisting high school seniors. And um, the, the goal being, these are the students that are currently filing FAFSA for um, college next fall season. And um, as long as you're working with a population that fits that, whether you're a high school or maybe Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, um, an Indian organization, we're going to support and, and help you do so. The agenda today will move through some slides about how to prepare and upload the roster process. So this is how you're going to communicate to us who your students are, and um, we will know who to provide information back on. We will um, review some of the view, the, the data view that you can have in the system and how to utilize that data. Um, we'll talk about researching data discrepancies, um, outreach to us if you're having difficulty, you want your students, you know, that you know they did a FAFSA, but you're not seeing them, what steps can you take to, to problem solve that. Um, we'll talk about learning um, successful strategies to use the system, as well as accessing other resources. One of the key points with um, setting up an account is we have to get in place what's called a data sharing agreement. And so those of you that have maybe re recently signed up, if your um, entity, if your organization was new to the process of FAFSA Plus, then I would have sent to you a, a follow-up email about a data sharing agreement. 
anyone who's not currently participating and becomes a new site, you would get this document. And it's just really important. This is about um, reassuring that student level data is secure and is not being shared with unauthorized users, um, that it's being used um, specifically by your entity um, for the, the success and partnership with you and your student. Um, this data sharing agreement is traditionally signed by principals at the institutions or or maybe their superintendent. Um, we can guide you through if you have questions. The agreement is put on file for up to the five years. Um, you could ask for an agreement to end earlier. Most everybody has them for the five year limit. Um, so each five years we would reestablish a new agreement um, with your institution. The data access list, um, there's a variety of um, people that can have access. One of the important things to know is um, you, you can specifically ask for somebody to have access for FAFSA Plus only, um, but anyone who has access to our partner portal system um, for your school or your entity will have access if you become a FAFSA Plus user to see that data. Um, so FAFSA Plus is tied to the um, entity, to the high school or the um, community-based organization, not to a specific user. Um, but we can set up, if you have somebody who's, whose primary focus will be FAFSA Plus, we can set them up to where they don't have all the other accesses that Partner Portal um, may come equipped with. The initial access list will be based on the online application. Um, when you first set up an account, after that, um, you can you can go through the application again if you want to set somebody up that way, but it's really easier to just email directly. Um, so just reach out, let us know. As long as you're already a FAFSA Plus institution, we can go ahead and make sure that we get partner portal access for anybody new to the organization. So the next couple of slides are going to go through um, how to prepare a roster, uploading it, and um, getting the information into our system to um, help us know who you're um, following. So the roster process, when you log into your portal, um, there will be some guides for you to walk through. Your roster has to be in a specific format, um, and it has to have um, some specific columns set up. Um, this data should only be about high school seniors. This is one of those times where we don't want to plan early with junior information. Um, it's, it's all about your high school seniors, those expected to graduate this school year entering um, um, higher education next fall. Um, you do not include column headers in this process. The race code column, you're going to use specifically what your site uses currently. So however you code for that. Kristen, I'll fall to you real quick um, because we had a question I wasn't able to ask um, earlier. Um, if a student has entered multiple race um, um, options, do you just want one or can the system handle more than one? Um, I do believe that the system can handle more than one. However, there can't be any commas. Um, so you would just um, kind of make that a run-on um, sentence Got somewhat. Um, and you can also just put multiple races, whatever it, it's pulled from your system, um, use that. And we'll talk a little bit about if our system doesn't like how it's formatted, um, the process for um, making that correction. Um, so if for some reason you try to upload something, it's not formatted correctly, we can help you with that. Perfect. So, um, You'll have the four columns, um, the uh, last name, first name, date of birth, and then the race column. Um, occasionally, you may have um, a column E. So um, this is for non-high school sites. So if it was a Boys and Girls Club or a YMCA, they're going to have a column E to input what high school that student is connected with. Um, you will um, want to save this roster um, as a um, .csv file. So let me move to the next here. So when you go to do a file save as, you want to make sure to save as type a um, comma deeliminated the CSV. Um, save it however you want in your file name process. Try to keep that organized year to year so you know um, which file um, you're working from. 
and you're going to upload this file just one time. Um, so just organizing them by school year or by FAFSA plus folder, however that works best for you. Remember that this file does include personally identifiable information. You are going to want to make sure that it's staying in a secure um, space within your institution. And I've got a quick question. So can the yeah. race column be left blank? Maybe the family didn't share that info. I believe that is a yes. Right. Um, so there does have to be something in that column. Um, you can put an in a or blank or chose not to answer, um, but you there has to be some sort of text in the column or there will be an error message for that student when you try to upload. Okay, I will add that to the slide for next time because that's a good tip to have unknown. Um, um, uploading the roster is pretty easy. So if you've um, been familiar with the Partner Portal Access, when you become a FAFSA user in the drop-down options of, of the resources you have access to, you'll see FAFSA Plus right away. Um, and um, you might have a whole list of, of things here. You might have just one or two things, and that's okay. Um, when you are um, logging into the partner portal, if you're having any difficulty, um, there you know, are certain times throughout the year where you may, um, your account may have deactivated, um, you may not have logged in enough, your password may have expired, different things that have happened. You can always try initially to do like a forgot password option, see if that's all it is. Um, if you're still struggling, it's probably that you've been deactivated and you just need to reach out to us we can reactivate those pretty quickly. Um, for this, you could do our public programs email, you could do our FAFSA plus email, um, and we'll share that information. Um, if you're an existing user, you're going to just be able to log in right away, nothing extra special for you to do to get FAFSA plus once you've submitted that application, you're just gonna, the link will automatically appear once we've set that up. If your institution is already a part of FAFSA plus, then you would already actually be able to go in and you'll see um, a FAFSA plus icon. Um, and then Michelle, we've got another question. So only one upload allowed per year. Later entering seniors, for example, would just not be included? No, so yes and no. So you're gonna upload the roster one time at the beginning of your school year. Um, after that, you're just going to put in um, the new students that need to be added. And we'll cover that here in just a moment. Um, when you're uploading the roster for the very first time, um, there will be a choose file option. So you'll go out, you'll search for your file. Um, making sure that you're choosing the, the .csv um, file format and um, clicking the upload button will get you there. You can see on this screen as well, it talks about those instructions again, giving you the tip, making sure that it's a CSV file, um, making sure that it's only high school senior information, not including those headers, and then what column information you're supplying that will always be out there, that instruction guide. So if you forget from one year to another, when you log in, do a quick refresher on the instructions um, to, to create that file. Click on your upload button. And then when you do your upload, you'll do your choose file, or sorry, you'll do your choose file, and then you'll do your upload. When the choose file comes in, this example that we've got here was our previous little template that we had done, that roster dot template, making sure you've got your CSV and then clicking on that upload. When you um, have successfully uploaded the initial roster, um, your site will no longer upload any new rosters to add new seniors, so it'll be a different process. If you uploaded an incorrect rox uh, roster, um, say last year's accidentally um, or an incomplete um, roster, you're not going to be able to fix it. We're going to help you fix that. And so you'll email us um, to, to be able to do that. <clears throat> you'll upload again the one main roster at the start of the, the new school year. And then any additional students, you can add those um, students um, individually or by uploading a roster with just those students. Is that correct, Kristen? She nodded her head. Yeah. 
Yeah, you could do like a mini second roster with only the new students. Most schools opt to add them individually because there's usually not very many that um, come in all at once. Um, however, if you find that there's 10 or more students and you'd just rather upload another second mini roster, um, that's totally fine. Yep. And that's something, you know, if you don't get a student till four or five months down the road and, and um, you forget that step, just, just email, just check in and, and we'll offer that assistance. When you're ready to start viewing data, so generally if you upload a roster um, within a week now at this point, um, since we're reporting and pulling in FAFSAs, you should have start seeing information hopefully within a week to two weeks, as long as there's no errors with your students information pulling in. Um, if you've uploaded a roster and it's, you know, a month later and you're still not seeing information, then, then you might want to check in and, and reach out. Um, a lot of schools are already seeing information for the 22-23 FAFSA and um, have been corresponding back and forth with us. Um, so it's pretty um, instantaneous that you're going to have access to see who um, has FAFSA information reporting in. Um, there are three different um, options that you're going to have when you log in after you've uploaded a roster. You're going to have an individual FAFSA status page, and this is where you're going to be able to view the most up-to-date federal FAFSA data on your students. If you are working with Sarah and you just want to make sure that, you know, Sarah's gotten her FAFSA and everything's looking okay, you're going to click on this option and a report will prompt and you can see if you've got data on Sarah or not. Um, it'll be a whole list of everybody alphabetically for you to review. This data is refreshed um, twice a week, by the way. The FAFSA status Excel, this is where you can download, um, it'll be an Excel file. Um, when you download this, um, we just recommend that you do it, um, you know, try to do it weekly or if you're gonna do it bi-weekly, but try to make sure that you're dating this file so that you're always referring back to the most um, recent download that you've done and um, keep history, depending upon how you're wanting to use that data, um, recalling, you know, at week one, we had X number of FAFSAs filed. At week 10, we had this many filed. Um, so just try to create your, create how you plan to stay organized with that early. Your FAFSA status history, um, this is as you have been with FAFSA Plus year after year, you'll start seeing um, more and more data build off of that. And um, we'll give you an example of what that looks like here in just a second. This is the FAFSA Plus history um, view. So depending upon when a school joined FAFSA Plus will determine how much information they have here. And of course, newer schools may have no information until um, we start getting their 22-23 school year. Um, it's just going to let you know, you know, what was the roster size. Um, roster sizes, I believe, pull from department um, ODE, Oregon Department of Education? No? Is that their class size? So the roster size um, is the number of students included on your roster. The ODE senior enrollment number, um, it was listed for a few years. I don't believe it's been loaded into our system okay. for the last few years. Um, that's something that we hopefully can add back. Um, but we do these percentages based on the roster size because it gives sites um, a clear view of what's happening right now. The ODE senior enrollment number usually changes. It's not usually right. the same after October 1st, all year round. And so we actually um, will um, give you percentages and display it based on your roster size. And that's why we're really clear. This is your roster size, the submitted percentage of the roster. Um, and we're all using the data you provide for us, not the ODE senior enrollment um, it, within the system, if that makes sense. Thank you, Kristen. Does that make sense to everybody? We're using your numbers, not ODE. Um, when you're in the um, portal, there'll be different views that you have. This is just a summary view. So it's telling you your overall roster size, the submitted count. It gives a nice little pie chart so you can kind of see where you're at. Um, there's um, rejected um, 
counts, we'll talk about what that means. Um, and then just percentage of overall, how many have completed versus not submitted. Um, just a nice way for you to view all of that um, collective information. On the um, student level data as to what you can see about a student, um, you'll be able to see last name, first name, date of birth, race. That's all the information you've provided. That's the information we're using to help match and connect students um, to you. You'll see a transaction date. A transaction date is when the student submitted the FAFSA, where a process date is when it has cleared with um, CPS and gone through to schools. Um, the verify true and the rejected false or verified false, rejected true, um, these can get um, a little bit um, tricky to, to learn. So we have a slide coming up where we're going to talk about those um, in some detail. And this is what it'll look like as you're moving through and just seeing the, the basic information that you can find on a student. A verified means whether or not the Department of Education has selected a file for verification or not. So um, verification um, is a process where typically Department of Education selects the file. Occasionally a school for one reason or another might select the file for verification. When a file is selected for verification, that work is done at the college, at the university um, level, and um, with the financial aid office there. And so if, when you're looking at a student for verified, it says true, then it means that some information is going to be needed um, from this student to be verified. It means they've been selected for verification. The, the wording here is maybe not um, the best. Um, but verified true status means there is further action for that student to do with the financial aid office or offices that they are considering as a part of their um, higher education. This could be financial documentation. It could be reviewing their dependency status. It could be an educational purpose statement. There's a wide variety of what they might need to do with their college, um, but the, the important piece is there is a next step with the college. Um, if the verified column says false for the student, then no verification is needed at this time. Verification can change. If a student is making corrections on a FAFSA, that can cause a verification to get flagged. If um, there's an update through um, NSLDS um, or any other um, system within the Department of Education, then a new transaction might come to the college and that transaction can be selected for verification. Um, sometimes a student might be working with a school and they note something and the school has to then select them for verification. So you just want to be careful with students when it does say false, that almost always stays true for students unless there's a lot of activity happening or they've, they've got some changes that they've made or indicated with their school. Um, so they should always keep posted on what's happening at um, their institutions that they're considering and making sure to connect often with their financial aid office ahead of starting school in their, in their following fall. A rejected status, let me pull this up. This is where the true and false mean slightly different. In this case, a rejected means that something is happening with their FAFSA and it is not clearing the um, full process with the Department of Education. When a FAFSA is rejected, it'll say true, and true means the application is rejected. In this case, it means there's something for the student to possibly do. This means they may have done an um, incorrect social security number, um, maybe there's something wrong with the birth date, um, things aren't matching, um, maybe a FAFSA is not signed, maybe the student signed it but the parent never went back and signed it. Um, there's a variety of things that could be occurring um, that are causing this FAFSA to not fully process um, on, on the Department of Education side. If rejected says false, then this application is not rejected and that's a good thing. It means that it, it should be processing and telling you if it is selected for verification or not um, and, and it would have a, a whoops, full packet um, to process um, at the institution level. They'll be able to, to continue working with that student. 
Um, <clears throat> my prior experience as a financial aid advisor, if you see that a student says rejected, they can definitely go to FAFSA and try to see if they can figure it out themselves. If it's something easy, like the FAFSA not being signed, um, maybe they can see that they messed up on their social security number and transpose some numbers, um, then they should definitely try to make those corrections or finish the signing process themselves. If it says that it's rejecting and it doesn't look as obvious as to what it is, there are some things that are a little bit more complicated than these common reasons. And just having them reach out to one of the institutions, any institution they're considering that is reviewing financial aid will be able to see what is causing this to reject. Um, and then the student, if they are considering multiple schools and want a financial package from multiple schools, they are going to have to fix that reject issue potentially with each institution, depending upon what it is and the complexity of it. Um, and Michelle, but, we, we've got a quick question. Could it yeah. also be if the student is sending in a signature sheet, could it be rejected for that reason? It can be rejected in that um, only if, if the student was able to do a portion of it because um, if the student did their signature and then they're sending in the parent and it needs that parent piece, then it could reject um, because it's kind of in this limbo mode of it's not complete. Um, if the student and the parent are signing on a FAFSA on a, on a paper together, then theirs is just going to just not be at this level yet. It will not be submitted until it clears that process. Um, and so it just depends upon if it's the student and parent signing the paper or did the students do an electronic signature and not the parent, then that could be in a limbo mode. However, one thing to add is once the parent signature page is received and processed, if everything's good to go, it will change from false, from true to false. And that is something, thank you, Kristen, that we should mention on this one. Silly how I have to back up here. But so on this one, something to know since she's saying that about the other one, on a verified, if a student is initially true, and they need to do verification with their institution and they complete verification with an institution, this answer will never change. This answer is based on the fact that their FAFSA says this file is selected for verification. And so this value will always stay true. Um, many times I would have students say, well, you haven't told OSAC. Well, it's not that we haven't told OSAC and it's not that you haven't verified, but this value is coming from their FAFSA. So um, for, for staff at the high school level helping seniors, just know that if for verification it was true, it's never going to change to false because they finished it and that's okay. It's just making sure that they've reached out and done that process with their school. With the rejected, rejected means there's an error, the FAFSA is not processing correctly and something needs to happen. And then when Department of Education receives a valid FAFSA and processes that, theirs will change from a true, we need action, to a false, everything is cleared. Okay. So this will help us see that. So with a, um, a verified false file, everything's good. Um, at the time, everything's good, but they should always double check with their institution throughout leading up to their first year of, of attending. If the verified is true, they need to contact the college's financial aid office. And again, that's for any institution that they want an award package from. If they initially listed 10 schools and now they're down to considering just three of those schools, then they want to be working with each of those three financial aid offices. What is the verification requirement and what is their process and how to complete that because it is different with each school. With the rejected, if it is false, that is good. There's nothing for them to do. There's nothing holding up their, their FAFSA. If it is rejecting, then something is wrong. This is where they can go back to FSA, look at their FAFSA, see if they can correct it. If they're unsure of what's causing it to reject or don't understand, this is where my recommendation would be go to the financial aid office and get their guidance um, because they'll be able to walk them through. And sometimes if they do need documentation to help fix a rejection, they'll just help the student through that from that, from that point. 
And that's a lot of information and it can be confusing. And I didn't say this at the beginning, but I was an advisor for seven years, financial aid advisor for seven years. And these things are complicated even when you're sitting in that seat. Um, so please, if you're reading something and not sure what it is, just send an email, check in. I'd be happy to, to help guide it. Researching data discrepancies. So when, um, when um, information isn't showing about a student or you're, you're not sure um, the information's accurate, we can help you on um, how to navigate that. You're going to be able to see the status um, for many of the students, but some of them will be blank. So you can see some of these samples are blank and that data is not appearing. And if you know that a student um, has submitted a FAFSA and um, they're staying blank and they're never updating, then that's going to be a reason to, to look for a discrepancy. Um, First and foremost, if it's blank, um, ideally that means the student just hasn't done a FAFSA. And as soon as they do a FAFSA within five to 10 business days, you'd normally see the information update. If they have submitted the FAFSA and there's no data, um, then that's where there might be some kind of a discrepancy and we're here to help problem solve that. And um, we'll review what a couple of those might be. Um, one of the number one um, discrepancies is just the, the time lag. So we, we ask that you give it the five to 10 days. Um, and um, so a student files a FAFSA say on um, um, October 11th, I'm looking at the calendar above me, they filed the FAFSA on October 11th, 10 business days later would be October 22nd. Um, and it's now the 25th. And you still don't see information. It might just be that we haven't ran our process yet because we run that a couple times throughout a week. So if it's October 29th and you still don't see information, we should have ran that process during that week and you should now have updated. So if you're not seeing student information at that point, check in, let's see what else could, could be happening. The student's name or date of birth, if there isn't a, a clear match, could um, cause um, discrepancies there. Making sure that students know when they file a FAFSA, they have to use the name on their social security card. Um, I, I know in um, school settings, kids can change their first name, you know, to whatever they want to be called. What's their nickname? What's this? Um, but making sure that AJ, Alexis, um, which name is really on your social security card, and that's the name that we're putting on a FAFSA. So teaching them nicknames can't be used, um, um, you know, ab abbreviated names. You know, we have to start learning that um, um, for legal purposes, you know, we have to use our real name in some settings, and this is one of those. Um, date of birth, a lot of times um, with date of birth, I see just um, transposing of numbers, um, you know, occasionally you'll have a student get the month and the day um, mixed in the way they enter it. So just um, having them be mindful to slow down when they're doing data entry of these important details. Same thing, social security number. I'm sure you guys see this a lot. I see a lot of times where students will start out doing like an area code 541 and then the rest of their social security number, um, 503, the rest of their social security number. So it's just those little things of guiding them and, and reminding them to double check those things um, just because it can create a lot of work for them to clean up if, if there is an um, issue with their important data. Um, residency is um, um, one of the things that can come up for students. So um, for OSAC um, funds, OSAC resources, they're for Oregon residents only. Um, so if a student is not an Oregon resident, um, then they're not going to show up. Um, so you want to review in this case, looking at a student SAR, the student aid report, um, seeing what they've said. If um, they listed something other than Oregon, um, then you'll have to determine if it's appropriate to change that and correct it or not. Um, if they're a resident of another state, then OSAC would um, never receive their financial aid information. So um, at our level, we only get FAFSAs for a student who on the FAFSA put Oregon. And um, so then you'll only ever see that information as well. 
High school code is really important. So sometimes students choose not to use the drop down menu and they type in your high school code. I've been doing a lot of outreach with schools lately as we work through um, a manual process that we have to do on our end to clean this part up. If a student is um, typing in a high school name and only do a portion of the name or just they leave it blank, um, then the student's not going to fully match to your school. Um, we do have a process where we can go and try to find um, students that are in that situation, um, but that is manual and there's a couple hundred students at a time that we have to go in and, and push through to match them to your institution. Encouraging use of the drop down menu instead of um, hand typing it um, or, or in some cases where they just skip it, um, putting that high school information is really important. And then one of the most common things that I get asked is a lot of people start out thinking that it is this one, which is um, not generally the case, but it can happen. Um, a lot of times when they don't see student information, they think that that means the student filed the wrong FAFSA year. Most of the cases I've had so far have been one of the first four reasons, but it is possible that students could file the wrong FAFSA year. So if a student, um, if you're sitting down in a computer lab and you're doing this all as a group, everybody's working on it, or you have a FAFSA evening for students and parents to come in in the evening, um, unfortunately, when they are filing their FAFSA, there's two cycles open during that period. And so it's really, really important to um, stress at the beginning, make sure that we're filing the right school year. For your seniors, they should be filing the FAFSA for 2022-2023. Um, the 22-23 school year being which they would start their higher education experience. And um, right now, the 21-22 school year for current freshmen in college is open still, while the 22-23 is open for next year. And so as you're working with families, um, if they're going to file on their own, just kind of guiding them to know um, the importance of those. Sometimes they'll see, oh, 21, 22, and I'm graduating in 2022, and I'm starting classes in fall of 2022, but that's not what makes it. And so just guiding them on, on how to do that piece. With um, how to research um, data discrepancies, um, the, the big thing is reaching out to us and um, just letting us know that there's a problem. You don't need to give us a whole lot of information. We actually prefer less um, in this situation. Um, just email us at our FAFSA plus dot, uh, at heck.organ.gov. Um, if you forget that email and you remember the public, the, the um, um, public programs at heck.organ.gov, they'll forward it over to me, but um, try to, to use the FAFSA plus that goes directly to us. We um, just need a student name. So we're going to search you um, and that's how we're going to find you in your high school. And then we will go and find your student um, and figure out what's happening in a data discrepancy issue. Please do not include social security numbers. Do not include date of birth. Um, just simply a name um, will, will be enough. And um, if we have any issues finding a student, then we would reach back out to you to um, problem solve that further. Try to respond to these pretty quickly. I've, this is where I've been learning FAFSA Plus more in my um, training is by getting these and sleuthing them out. Again, on that previous slide, a lot of them just tend to be these top couple things. A couple of them has just been timing, but a big one um, right now is this high school code. So um, as you're continuing doing FAFSAs with students this year or in future years, um, this is a big one, uh, making sure that they put your high school in correctly or their high school if you're a community-based organization. There are a lot of resources um, on FSA's website. If you um, are not familiar with FSA's website, I would encourage you to. Um, I'm guessing if you're helping students navigate FAFSA, you've probably been on the FSA website some. Um, you can't really break anything on their website. You can really only learn a lot of um, um, resourceful, helpful information. And um, they have a couple different ways to contact. Um, in all of my years as a financial aid advisor, I encouraged the um, direct call number. Um, and if it's live, the live chat feature is helpful. 
um, because you'll get um, response um, pretty quickly in both of those. Sometimes the hotline is busy and a student does have to wait, um, but it is, it is the quickest way to get a response. Um, you can send email to FSA. I, I rarely encouraged that um, if a student was regularly not getting a response or needed a response in writing for some reason maybe, um, but most of your um, getting started type troubleshooting with a FAFSA application, um, calling the hotline and using that live feature are the best. We, this is a really tiny screen. I'm not sure how much you can see with this one, but we have resources as well. So um, we have a fact sheet for the FAFSA's rejecting and the verification. What does that mean? As well as um, um, possible um, documentation and things that a student might need to be prepared for. Um, and we'd be happy to, to help with the reference guides and, and how to, um, help the student navigate those processes. Additional resources beyond FAFSA Plus, um, OSAC offers out, um, outreach requests. So we would um, love to engage with your high schools, um, work with the students and parents in a wide variety of ways. We have a FAFSA line by line um, presentation that we give. We have a finding funds presentation and um, lots of ways to, to help students navigate um, financial aid resources, literacy, and preparing for um, higher education. Um, we have a scholarship workshop where we can talk more about scholarship resources and um, the, the process um, through OSAC for um, the scholarships that we have um, an application for. We have publication guides. Um, Carrie is an expert on all things publication and may be able to offer um, some more there. And then um, information about our state grants. So if you're on our OregonStudentAid.gov website, just like the StudentAid.gov website for federal, you can't really break anything. You can just only find really good information. Um, Oregon Opportunity Grant information, Oregon Promise information, um, staff that work at OSAC, when we have a question um, from one of you or from a student, nine times out of 10, we're going to our website to get the answer because that's where the most up-to-date and accurate information is. And so I um, encourage you to try to get familiar with the website, um, research information there. Um, if you're struggling to, to find um, answers to something, please reach out to us and, and we'll um, help you navigate that wide variety of publications that are available both in English and Spanish and um, we'd be happy to to talk more about that or if you have something specific ask in the the chat and um, we can talk about how to get access um, uh, for those there's um, a variety of booklets and um, posters different things that you could have available within your um, career and advising centers do you want me to jump in real quick? I do. <laughs> um, so the FAFSA ORSA challenge is a statewide challenge for 51% of Oregon high school seniors in public schools to complete um, either the FAFSA or the ORSA. Um, OSAC releases data reports um, on a quarterly basis on our website to kind of track this. Um, a percentage of um, completed FAFSAs and ORSAs at each Oregon public high school um, is included as well as a statewide running total and our goal is 51% this year. So um, just some things to be thinking about. Um, we're a little bit into um, the, the fall semester for our high schoolers, um, but just making sure that you have some strategies in place and how to reach them to boost those FAFSA applications um, or ORSA, because we want you to, to boost both um, regardless of FAFSA plus. Um, so the big thing is beginning that marketing early. You know um, how busy families are and how busy students are. Um, so deciding 
mean for, for your population? What does that look like? Um, creating flyers and mailers, using your social media accounts, um, using your school website, your email systems, whatever that might be, to try to get as much outreach happening regarding FAFSA and ORSA um, and throughout the school year, finding ways to connect with students again. Um, you know, OSAC scholarships open on November 1st. And oh, by the way, if you forgot, here's how to apply for FAFSA and ORSA, um, sending those reminders and nudges um, as you move throughout the school year. Um, using one-on-one -on -one communication, making sure that you're doing um, more personalized outreach to some of the students and families that may need that, um, helping parents um, become a part of the conversation about financial aid and resource and what that is, um, helping to kind of break some of the, the myths and barriers that are sometimes there with um, what financial aid even is or what does a FAFSA help a student get access to um, and, and helping them navigate some of that. We encourage you to host virtual parties or events, or now that hopefully we can be a little bit more live and in person, depending upon where you are um, in interacting with your families and students in that way. Um, and we would love to be a part of that at um, OSAC. If, if the opportunity is there, you could put in a request for us to, to do so. Um, and finding ways to provide um, incentive for students in how they can um, um, you know, progress and meet some of these goals um, that um, help them in the long run and, and um, navigate um, the, the financial side of planning for college and, and achieving the goals um, in doing so. So this is the OSAC website. Hopefully you guys are very familiar with our website. If not, like I said, you can't break anything, head out out there, um, you know, looking at all the details. I know as a financial aid advisor, I spent almost every day something on this website um, was needed. There's information as a college educator, there's information as I'm the high school student, I'm the college student, I'm a foster youth student. So we try to break it down um, to help students guide it. If there's specific grant information, you can access things in a variety of ways. We might have the hyperlinks live here. You might go to grants, look at the whole grants page, find what you're looking for, um, scholarships, can't say it enough, this is opening really soon on the first, so um, really important opportunities coming up. Um, but we have the outreach resources. So this is where you can come out, you can request for a presenter. Um, this is where you registered for webinars um, and um, you can uh, order or download some of those publications. More importantly, you can get started in that FAFSA Plus program. And so it's really easy to come out here look at the FAFSA Plus information. You can apply for FAFSA Plus. Remember, it is a non-competitive application. This is just so that we can get the information that you're wanting to be involved and start that connection and, and get that data sharing agreement to you. So you tell us who you are, who your administrator is, what do we need access for? And then will other people need access? You can say yes or no. If you say yes, it's gonna allow you to keep adding as many people as you'd like. Um, we get these um, applications and try to process them within a week to two weeks. Generally, we, we get them all in process. You'd have an email back. If it's longer than that, check in because it might mean something didn't come through to us. Um, pretty easy to put in that request and, um, and start the, the program. It's not too late for the 22-23 school year, so you can still get an application in. Um, you can still um, submit that roster and start reviewing your students for this year. There's um, just different details out here, social media kit information. Um, just things that can give you some ideas on um, connecting with students and um, overview of what we talked about and some user training. And then once you're in access, um, once you have access, there are some um, guides that we would send you as well to help you with, with your experience. <laughs>